Well, hello, Hillcrest. Uh, for this morning's devotional, I wanted us to take a look at just a few, pick a few places out of Genesis chapter 22. Uh, we're going to be here this week and probably next week at least as we continue to look at this very important and, and packed chapter. But I want us to look at uh, some verse, a verse or half a verse that we looked at at the beginning, uh, half of verse one, uh, and then um, around, let's see, let's say 11 and 12 and then 15 and following. So kind of uh, the beginning and then near the end. Uh, so remember that it begins with, after these things, God tested Abraham. Uh, and then we have the story as it unfolds. And then in verse 12, verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your only son from me. And then in verse 15, and the Lord, angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies and in your offspring shall the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So we have here a couple of verses out of this chapter that that set the broader event in its proper context. And I, and I wanted to look at just, um, again, that, that simple phrase, God tested Abraham. And then I want us to come down and look at verse 12, for now I know, and then understand what happens in verses 15 through 18 through that lens. So, so first of all, remember that we have here a test. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, the best way to understand this is not uh, a test in which God is seeking to learn something that he doesn't already know. That's not what is going on here. In fact, perhaps a better word for this would be that God tried Abraham. Um, but maybe even a better way of explaining it is through the context of refining. Uh, that when a goldsmith or a silversmith, a metalsmith, is refining a piece of metal, um, according to the, the scripture's usage of these words, he could be described as testing that metal or trying that metal. And we have to understand that, that a, a goldsmith does not refine gold. He doesn't place gold into the refining fire in order to find out what's inside. That's not why a goldsmith does what he does, right? Uh, you refine gold because you know what's inside of it. Right? You refine gold because you know there's gold in there and you want to remove the dross and you want to retain, you want to keep the gold. That's why you refine it. It's not a guessing game. It is a, uh, it's a process that you go through in order to transform this gold mixed with dross into pure gold. And that is precisely what is happening here. God is testing or trying or again, better refining Abraham. And, and God is refining Abraham because God knows that there's gold in Abraham, right? And God knows that there is this precious reality to Abraham, not because of Abraham himself. God knows that there is gold, metaphorically speaking, right? There's gold in Abraham because God has placed it there. God has placed it there through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. Um, and so this trial, this test, this refinement is part of this process by which God is transforming Abraham, by which he is refining him, by removing that dross of sin and strengthening or leaving behind uh, the pure gold of faith, of hope, and love. We also have to wrestle then with what the angel of the Lord says to Abraham in verse 12, now that I know that you fear God. And we can't say that this is merely an angel who is not omniscient saying these things because this is the angel of the Lord, which is often used in the Old Testament as a theophany or as a, uh, as, as a God revealing himself in a uh, in, the, in the person of an angel, right? It's not an incarnation, as we'll see 
in Jesus Christ in the New Testament, but it is someone speaking on behalf of God, right? It's, it's an appearance of the Lord uh, here in the form of this angel, of the angel of the Lord. And so it's not just, it's not Gabriel saying, well, I didn't know before, and I long to look into these things, as the author of Hebrews says, but rather the reality that here is God saying these words through his angel, now I know that you fear the Lord. But we also have to, again, wrestle with the reality of language and what language means and the differences between the way we use words and the way in which Moses in particular, who's writing this, uh, uses these words. Because uh, for Moses to know something is more than just to reach an intellectual understanding of it. Um, uh, you can see some of them in the background, but there's a lot more in this room, right? There's tons of books in this room. And by reading those books, I can come to an intellectual understanding of some things. Uh, for instance, lots of books on the history of the Reformation. And by reading those books, I can come to an intellectual understanding of the times of Calvin and, and all the rest of those reformers. That's a very different thing than going, let's say, to Geneva today and walking the same streets that, that Calvin walked. That's one experience that I don't have. But even then, that's a very different thing than walking the streets of Geneva in the days of Calvin, right? With Calvin next to you and knowing him and, and understanding him. There's a, there's a very different uh, reality between, again, that intellectual apprehension of something or someone and an actual living experience of it. And as we look at this passage, we recognize that, that God knows intellectually what is going to happen. Uh, God knows what Abraham will do. God knows Abraham's obedience intellectually because God knows all things that he has decreed, right? He knows according to his intellect, he knows according to his understanding, all that he has decreed to come to pass. In fact, that's why he knows that Abraham will do what Abraham does in Genesis chapter 22, because God has decreed that he would do these things. And so he has an absolute knowledge, an absolute and certain knowledge of, of all of the events in this chapter and every other chapter and every chapter of your life that could be written. God knows these things because he has decreed them. And so in that sense, God learns nothing new in Genesis chapter 22. But we also recognize that God graciously interacts with us according to our manner of understanding, and in particular, but according to where we currently are. Think about David, right? When David sins with Bathsheba, God could say, well, I know that in a few days or weeks or whatever it was that, that David is going to repent, uh, that he's going to repent in tears and is going to recognize how deeply he has sinned against me and against his, his friend Uriah, against Bathsheba, against, against the nation, against himself. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and forgive him and restore him right now because I know that's going to happen. But God doesn't treat us that way, does he? And in fact, if God had done that, then we wouldn't have Psalm 51, for instance. Right? We wouldn't, David would not have experienced the reality of the depths of his sin. He, he merely would have experienced an outpouring of grace without repentance. Right? God could say, well, I know you would repent if I kept this up, so I'm not going to do that. But he doesn't treat us that way. God uh, allows us to go through those valleys and through those sort of mountaintop experiences because he wants not only for us to have the experience of that grace, whether it's the grace of joy or the grace of repentance, they're both grace. He wants us to have that experience, but also because God wants us together to have that experience. Um, you see, when he says, now I know that you fear God, there's a sense in which what God is meaning by this is that now you and I have the shared experience of you obeying me, even in this horrendous command that I've given to you. Now we have this shared experience that, 
that you know that I am a good and a gracious God and who I am not going to require you to take your son's life. In fact, I'm going to bless the world through the offspring, your offspring, but also his offspring. But, but Abraham also now has the experience of God's grace and presence and power and goodness and love. And so these two things right now, there is something that is in a, in a sense new in the relationship between Abraham and God. It's not God knows these things, but now there is this, this shared experience between the two of them. Right? God can interact with Abraham according to the obedience of Abraham. Right? There are new storehouses of blessings that are opened up because Abraham obeyed God. And, and again, you see that even in verse 15 and following where the promises are not only confirmed, reconfirmed, we could say, but the, the floodgates of, of God's grace and mercy are opened up here. Your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies, and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Uh, you have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply. Again, that all of these things, that, that what is increasing here is Abraham, or on the one hand, is God's uh, outpouring of these blessings. But also, Abraham can interact with God according to this chapter because he has increased assurance of these promises that God has made. Right, His, his faith, his hope, his love have blossomed through this experience with God. And this is a good reminder of why we also go through trials, right? God brings us through our various trials, um, both in the sense of the valleys of sin and, and even uh, the heights of, of success. Both of those can be trials. Both of those can refine us. God brings us through these things because he wants to refine us. He wants to remove the dross of sin of idolatry, of selfishness, and he wants to increase or to refine or to burnish that image of Christ that is in us, that goodness, that righteousness that he has placed there by his Holy Spirit, the works, the good works that he has prepared beforehand for us to walk in. He wants us to grow in those, and so he brings us through these trials. But also because through these trials, through that process of refinement, there is this new experience of God's grace and of his love. We could say, right, that again, right, we have an intellectual apprehension of God's grace and mercy and love. We can read it in his word. We can read of it not only of God's, um, you know, the inerrant word of God, of how God has worked amongst his people, but we can, again, look back through history and see all the many ways that God has worked marvelously for his glory and for the good of his people and say, yes, I have an understanding that God would do such things. And yet God loves us enough that he brings us through those same sort of circumstances so that we will know, we will have a personal present experience of his grace. And so if you're hearing these words today and you're in the midst of a trial, whether it is the heights of, of success or the, the depths of the reality of your own sin or of uh, living in a world filled with other sinners. Know that God is bringing you through these things and is allowing you to experience them and is indeed experiencing, experiencing them with you, walking with you as you experience them because he loves you, because he longs to see your gold refined and because he wants you to have new experiences of his grace and of his love, that your relationship with him would grow, uh, would mature, would deepen, would broaden as you face all things with God's grace shining down upon you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for not only the reality of your word that reminds us of your character, uh, what you do and, and gives us an insight into why you do what you do and why you do it the way that you do it. And Father, we pray this morning that for those of us uh, in this congregation and uh, family and friends of ours who are facing difficult trials this day, again, Father, whether they are the trials of the heights or the, or the depths, we pray that you would bless your people. We pray, Father, that you would fulfill even this promise that you made to Abraham uh, so many thousands of years ago, 
uh, that you would bless all the nations of the earth through him, uh, not just through his faith, but also through his offspring, as Paul understands it, uh, that the offspring that would come forth here is Christ Jesus, and that you would bless the earth through his obedience, through his life, his death, and his resurrection. Father, we pray that as we face our trials, that you would increase, that you would grow, that you would burnish our love for you and our obedience to your word, to your will, and to your love. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless and uh, look forward to seeing you this coming Lord's Day.